grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As, uh, as I said this morning, uh, we're going to begin a series starting today talking about how, how the Spirit changes us, how because of Christ, we are transformed, right? Christ changes things. In fact, He changes us. And, and we want to start today with this, well, an opportunity for us to look through a, a portion of the letter to the Ephesians. The Apostle Paul, by God's inspiration, wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, a Christian church, a gathering of Christian people. And, and he writes in chapter 4, God gives words that describe the unity of his church, the unity that should exist among, among us. And so, of course, we know that God's church should be unified even throughout the world, but, but to make it practical, we know that God desires for us to be unified, even right here within this little small part of the body of Christ here within this congregation. And, and, yet, unity, and yet unity is hard. Uh, th- this happened several years ago, um, I don't know, quite a few years ago, a different state, different place, different church, um, a gathering of God's people, leaders within the church. They were actually the elders of the church, and they were getting together to meet one evening to discuss a kind of a, a mess, a little matter that was happening within the church at the time. And uh, they're there meeting, the pastor's there meeting with them, kind of explaining, uh, helping them to get caught up on what happened. And, and this is the scenario. Uh, the scenario that a, a lady um, was offended by something that another lady did. And, um, and instead of coming together, instead of speaking about that offense, instead of giving an opportunity for uh, you know, uh, an apology to take place, for forgiveness to happen, instead, the one who was offended uh, began to kind of embellish the story, call other people, tell other people, and, uh, and create it into this huge mess. All right, so now there's several families, they're, they're leaving the church, they don't want to be a part of this mess, and, and so the pastor contacted this person, invited them to come, they refused to even talk about it. Um, well, talk to everybody about it, but refused to talk to the person they needed to talk about it. So, so anyway, the church leaders are getting together and they're sitting and they're going to discuss how to handle this matter, uh, how to bring some forgiveness and some healing uh, among, among the people that are involved. And, uh, well, the conversation just didn't go real well. Uh, one person, one of these guys in the group, well, it was a long day for everybody. Everybody was tired. They were worn out from a long day of work. And then to discuss a matter like this, and one of the guys had already heard several versions of this story that had gone around and, um, and was getting angry. He was getting very angry. And, um, and, uh, and the others, the tension in the room was building because they saw this guy's anger boiling over. And, and this guy is, is uh, like pointing at the pastor and, and saying that the pastor was lying about this or that. And, and, and in fact, uh, acu- not only accusing the pastor, but then invited the pastor to go outside in the parking lot to settle the matter. And like, what in the world is happening here? And I know this story. I was that pastor that I'm telling you about. <laughs> I remember the story well, because then, then the guy stood up, and he was on a little folding metal chair, and it like flew back and, land, and crashed, and so it added to the, and then all the guys stand up, and, and so a couple of guys kind of physically restraining this guy, and, uh, and then you saw it happen. You saw, yeah, welcome to ministry, Tennessee. Um, but then you saw it happen. As soon as they like stop him, you, you see he realized his his shame, his regret, uh, his, his, his temper had gotten out of control, and it, and it was ridiculous, and he knew that. Uh, the, the bad part is that, man, it took a long time for him to um, get over that embarrassment, that regret, that sin, right? It took him a long time to, to work that through, and for, for unity to come back. It was like a year later before he even had a conversation, was willing to have a conversation with these other men that were there in that room. You know, unity is hard. Unity is hard because there's, there's not only the difficulties and the struggles that, that take place, but it's our own sin, too. It's our own struggle. And so we say stuff and we do stuff that, that causes disunity even in the body of Christ. And, and uh, you know this is true. 
You know it's true because if you're around the church any length of time, in, in fact, if you're around a group of people any length of time, you could probably tell a similar story. Maybe, maybe it was words that came out of your own mouth. Maybe it was actions that, that you did. Maybe it was actions you witnessed uh, or a hurt that you, that you endured. Uh, unity is hard. It's very hard. Uh, in fact, in our reading today, Ephesians 4 is a great chapter that describes the unity that God invites for his church. In fact, a little homework. Uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians all through the month. And so uh, next week, during the week, even over the next month, uh, spend a little time reading. It's a very short book. You could spend a little time each day reading. I encourage you at some point over the next couple of weeks to just sit down. Take you 20 minutes. Sit down and read this letter from start to finish. It's going to help with today's topic, and it's going to help with these topics that we're going to continue to spend some time on, not just in worship, but also in Bible study as well. Unity is, is difficult. Before I read through some of these texts that describe what God desires for us in terms of unity, let me just name a couple of examples that, um, that are our human ways that we think are going to bring about unity in God's church. Right? They're, these, uh, they're kind of imposters. Right? They look like unity. They act like unity. They're really not unity. But they're things that, that are done. The first one is uh, striving for unity through uniformity. That happens. In fact, e even in our church body, I know there's arguments, there's all kinds of discussion that happen around uniformity. Uh, meaning that, that kind of like Grace shared with the kids, if we were all the same, if we were all uniform in, in the way we look, the way we act, our culture, our background, our worship style, our, our, our clothing, the way we dress, whatever it is, if we were uniform and we were all the same, then that would somehow bring about a unity in God's church. Right? It happens. You hear arguments like this, I'm sure. Uh, that, if, that if we all uh, had the same ideas, if we all did the same things, if we all had the same history, if we all had the same background, if the color of our skin was all the same, then that would bring some kind of unity. The problem with that is that it's not biblical. It's not right. It's not only boring. But it takes away. It takes away the gifts that God gives. Uh, let me just read to you a couple verses from our reading um, Ephesians 4 speaks about this, and notice that this is a reading that it's about unity within the church, but it describes a diversity among God's people. A diversity in gifts, a diversity in background, a, diff a, a diversity in, in ability. It says this, uh, Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to his church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, the teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. It's just one very small example, but a very clear example. That because God has gifted his church in various and diverse ways, that we should raise up, lift up, and encourage the gifts that God gives. It's a diversity in people, but God would use it to bring about a unity among his people. Let me give you another example. This is another example of a, of a human way of bringing unity. And it sounds kind of strange at first. It sounds kind of ridiculous. But, but you'll hang in there. I think you'll agree with me. That, that there are people that strive for unity through ignorance and immaturity. The, the, the saying goes like this. Uh, uh, ignorance is bliss. Right? It's kind of the unofficial motto of those that would strive for immaturity and ignorance among God's people. It, it kind of goes like this, that some would come and say, well, you know what, I want to be a part of the church, but not really. I want to come to worship, but I want to stay out here on the fringe, because if I get too involved, I find out what's really going on, and I don't want to know what's really going on. I want to come and pretend like everything is just great and that we're all unified. Well, God actually speaks about that as well. What God really desires from us is maturity. What he, what he desires from us is not an ignorance of what's happening in other people's lives, but an interest in what's happening in other people's lives. Right? He calls us to be the body of Christ, and to be the body of Christ, you should be concerned about what the person behind you or in front of you or beside you is going through. 
Because God has called you to be the body for them. He's called you to be interested and concerned, to help them, help them in their struggle. Not to just be aware of it, but to be involved in their life. And yes, indeed, being involved in another person's life is probably going to mean that you're going to see the mess that's involved in another person's life. And they're going to see the mess that is involved in your life. We might think in human ways to think that that would bring all kinds of disunity. But actually what God describes is that brings unity. A real biblical unity. He says this. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. He wants us to be mature, to be interested, to be the body of Christ, that every part of the body is concerned with the health and the welfare of the rest of the body of believers. Uh, Finally, one more human way that we seem to strive for unity that is uh, a mistake, it's wrong. Um, There are some that are striving for unity by kind of modifying the truth or ignoring the truth altogether. We see that happening in our culture, in our lives. Maybe we even see it happening in our, in our own life, right? That if something is happening among a family member or a friend or, or a fellow church member and, and truth needs to be spoken, but oh, wait, if we speak the truth, it's going to cause some sort of divide or disunity. When actually what God says very clearly is that the truth must be spoken. He says it clearly. Instead, we'll speak the truth in love. We'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each does its part, its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We speak the truth in love which then brings not just kind of this fake kind of unity, but it brings a true unity among the body of believers. This is is how this word applies even for us here. We enjoy and celebrate a great unity. It's just a small part of the body of Christ that meets right here as Calvary. But there's some things that are really against us, things that fight against us, things that would seem to cause disunity. Right, we're different people. There's a lot of diversity. There's diversity in ages and backgrounds and cultures and colors and histories. There's a diversity in temptation and sin and struggle. Right? Uh, not only those things that would cause trouble for us, but there's an enemy. There's an enemy in Satan that would seek to cause a great disunity among us because a great disunity among us would then, well, would then keep us from living out the mission that God has entrusted to us. It would keep us from sharing this great unity that we would have with Christ. But you know, here in this place, we can't strive for unity among uniformity. We're not going to strive for unity by simply being ignorant of what's really happening in one another's lives. And we're not going to strive for unity by dumbing down or washing away the truth. In fact, God designs it differently. Here's the one beautiful, practical, wonderful advice that God gives to his church in this letter. And it simply says this. It says, be patient with one another. Be patient with one another, uh, allowing for the faults that you might see in one another because of your love. Now, this is something we can do. Right? It's something we can do because it's something we know. God is so patient with us. Right? God was so incredibly patient with us. Uh, not that he would just look away from our faults and our failures, but, but he was so patient in his love for us, even in our own sin, well, that he would send his son Jesus. And that Christ would die for us to give us perfect forgiveness. He would give us perfect unity with our Heavenly Father. So, of course... With this perfect, restored unity with our Heavenly Father because of Jesus Christ, we can live in unity, in patience, in love with one another. May that be true for us. 
Right? May, may we strive for a unity not based upon what our human understandings might bring, but may we strive for a unity uh, that is based upon what Christ would bring. And that unity is based and focused on and growing in Christ himself. Amen.